where they could observe the transit of Venus across the sun, and that was in 1769. <laughs> um, so he, uh, but you know, the British had a long history of going out exploring. The Beagle expedition, Darwin's expedition of the, of the 1830s was, of course, the one that set the stage for naturalists going to sea. You're going to go out to sea and observe things and take notes and write about it. You're not just out there for conquest and taking over land and catching fish and stuff. Um, but I think what was going on with the Challenger expedition is that Europeans had basically already explored the whole world with the mission of conquest and colonization. I mean, they were kind of done with that. So what's the next thing? The next thing is to go out and, uh, and attempt exploration for the, for the uh, sake of scientific um, advance. You know, there's some seats over there, you guys, on the edge. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, the goal... They were embarking upon nation building with a goal of scientific understanding. And you think that sounds a little bit suspicious as a motive, and I think it probably is. But you know what's interesting, if you think about people, they've been traveling all over the surface of the planet on these common trade routes for hundreds of years now, but they didn't know anything about what was below the surface. Totally unexplored territory. They had no idea. And the ocean's 3,000 meters deep. It's a pretty big expanse to know nothing about. <coughs> So in terms of this nation building thing, I know the Challenger expedition, we hear about it, we learn about it being this first big scientific expedition, but when you, the reading that we were able to do in this class, what you learned was that selling the expedition to the British government, selling it to the Royal Society who was then going to sell it to the British government, was all about insecurity relative to their status uh, with other countries. They were, they were trying to strike fear into the heart of the Royal Society. And, um, <clears throat> the information we have lately received as to the activity with which other nations are now entering upon all of these things. It was the United States they were insecure about. So those uppity people on the other side of the, of the ocean who had kicked their butts 150 years earlier, they were now going to start taking over the ocean, which the British owned. I mean, think about it. They felt like they owned the seas. Um, so that makes sense. <clears throat> So here's a few more sentences. Um, Having shown other nations the way to the treasures of knowledge which lie hid beneath the recesses of the ocean, we are falling from the van into the rear and leaving our rivals to gather everything up. Is this creditable to the power which claims to be the mistress of the seas? I loved it. Oh my goodness. And I read this. This was, um, you know, the, the report on the Challenger has a lot of this information, but I got this particular one out of this book by Lawrence called Upheaval from the Abyss, and I, w I like what he wrote about this quote, too, that Carpenter was dripping with imperial pride. <laughs> so I thought it was great. So um, deep sea exploration, one of the things that's be behind a lot of this is mining interest. They rarely mention it explicitly, but mining interest, the idea that there could be something really valuable down there was a, something that was a motivating factor for quite a bit of this. <clears throat> Okay, so this was the, is this a front page from the report of the voyage of the HMS Challenger? Now, the expedition ended in 1876, and this paper, this book, this tome, came out in 1885. So they wrote it within seven years, which is really impressive. If you've ever seen this, you need to, um, it's amazing how much information is in this. Mostly it's documentation to great detail of the flora and fauna that they found. Um, this volume is enormous, um, and if you go into our library, if you ever come back here during business hours when the library is open, walk into the library and ask our librarian to show you where the um, where these are, and they take up like two whole shelves in the library. It's just amazing. So it's actually a pretty neat way to do research. The students and I we just sat down and read through them, and having to find like how you cross reference to find stuff in these things is amazing. We're so used to looking at stuff on the internet and finding stuff fast, it doesn't work that way, but you learn so much as you try. It's really, really beautiful book. Um, <clears throat> and even though this isn't really that relevant to our story tonight, I thought I'd share a little bit about what we learned from, from the introduction to the Challenger expedition from Murray and Thompson's, Thompson's report, because they start out with this big, long chapter about the ancients' view of the ocean. Um, so the ancient Greeks, how do you say this name, Herodotus? Herodotus, thank you, thank you, Bobby. Herodotus, who is the father of modern uh, geography, they mentioned that he was writing all these things that he had no name for the Mediterranean. 
it was just so fundamental to the ancient Greeks' understanding of their concept of the universe and where they were that they didn't even have a name for it. Mediterranean, right? We know that means middle of the earth, right? Well, that was the center, but they didn't call it anything. And, and the other thing that we thought was really interesting was this mentioning of the Oceanus Fluvius in this Homer map, right? Long time ago, but that's a pretty sophisticated map, 1000 BC. What was the ocean to them? Fluvius, you know what that means, right? River, Oceanus, encircling. So it meant nothing other than that, which is out there that we don't understand, and nothing maybe beyond it. We have no idea what it is. So, um, but this was this was very interesting. We really enjoyed reading this part, but it's not that relevant to the uh, Challenger expedition exactly. Okay, I'm having some problems with the. Let me back. Oh, oh, it worked. Good. Okay, good. <coughs> okay. So one of the things that the Challenger expedition did um, was it introduced the concept of grid sampling. This picture is not from the Challenger. This is actually a picture from the Meteor expedition that the Germans did. I'm going to be showing you a bunch of, of figures from that expedition soon. But um, it just, it's kind of a better picture of the concept of uh, grid sampling. So if you think about naturalists and if you read um, accounts of the expedition, the people <laughs> were really carried away with the cool things, right? Like they'd write all these things about the, the islands that they visited and the people and what kind of crazy clothes they were wearing and stuff. And you're like, but that's not data. That's not about the ocean because humans are, we just can't help it. We're interested in describing things that are cool, right? So naturalists were doing a lot of that. I like that bird and I'm gonna write about it and stuff. But what these guys did was they sort of started this concept that if you're going to go out and make a study of something, you need to be really methodical about it and you need to stop and measure everything at all the places that you stop, even if what you're measuring seems really boring. And so they set up this grid sample thing where they would have a pre-decided set of locations and at each set, station you stop, you do a sounding, you collect a bottom dredge, collect water from a predetermined set of depths, so don't vary it, and you sample in that water for temperature and salinity, which gives you water density, do some chemistry, do some salts, and then do plankton toes at a variety of set depths and you might do, I, I mentioned a, a bottom dredge for the, the fauna and flora on the seafloor. So you're starting to build up a grid of data that can be used to make maps, and not just maps of the kind of, you know, geographical maps, but maps of data. And so this was a, a really new thing, and they were getting to the point where we could start thinking about dynamics, um, making something kind of like a weather map for the ocean density, <coughs> as well as all these other features. So these are just a few kind of cool pictures from the Thompson and Murray report. A, t a trawl, that looks a pretty cool looking trawl and you know, looks pretty much like trawls we use nowadays. And then we've got sifting dredge seafloor deposits on deck. That doesn't look too much like our uh, sediment uh, trapping mechanisms that we have now, but you know, concepts the same. Although we got a kick out of noticing in all these pictures that There'd be a, a sailor, you know, like an able-bodied seaman doing all the work while some guy wearing white pants and a suit was <laughs> hanging around. I mean, that's just so totally not the way oceanography works now, but we kind of got a kick out of that. <clears throat> a, a lot of, almost all the students who took the class are here, and so I want to encourage you guys to jump in and interrupt any moment. So when you think of things <coughs> I'm not mentioning. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna jump forward a couple decades to the early 20th century, and we're gonna talk about the German meteor expedition of 1925 to 1927. Um, and this is an expedition that was extreme, that is and was extremely important for oceanographers. It was a, a fundamental data set that led to a huge leap forward in our understanding of ocean circulation. But what I didn't know until I taught this class, I mean, I'd heard of the, of the meteor expedition. I just didn't really ever think about it too much, but I didn't know until we, till we did this class and I read the report that was by Fritz Spice, the captain of the ship and one of the scientific leaders, I didn't understand how nationalistic this whole expedition was. It was basically a way to recover German pride after their defeat and complete trampling by all the other European countries in World War I. So, um, all of the quotes that I'm going to show you and all the pictures that I'm showing you in the next set of slides come out of this report that was written by Fritz Spice. 
1928, so just a couple years after the expedition was concluded. He was the director of hydrographic, he was a hydrographic division director at this nautical department. I don't know exactly what that meant, but he was the captain of the ship and also a scientific leader. And um, it's just amazing to read the writings. This is the first person narrative of someone who was there and he's clearly got a political agenda as he writes the narrative. So some pieces of the narrative give us a sense of what, what the political agenda was leading into the expedition and some of them are sort of how great we did. So these are, this is, these are his words. Germany was downtrodden after World War I. Just six old battleships, six small cruisers, and two old flotillas of torpedo boats were left to Germany as the naval fighting force under the Treaty of Versailles. They weren't allowed to build any more Navy ships, and they really were not allowed to go out to sea anymore. <clears throat> Germany had lost its colonies and its overseas bases. The former enemy countries closed their harbors to German ships. There seemed to be no possibility that the fleet would ever again show the naval flag in distant oceans around the world where it had once fluttered in wartime with honor to reestablish contact with our oppressed fellow Germans. Kind of strange. I mean, oppress establishing contact with your oppressed fellow Germans is the main reason to go to sea? Okay, as I, as I tell you all this stuff, think about the next war that's coming down the road. This is 1925, 1928. You don't build a U-boat fleet in a year, right? So they're already getting themselves ready for the next one. <clears throat> so what they wanted to do um, really was to get out to the Pacific Ocean. Their, their original plan um, was to go into the Pacific and they had actually built this ship, I think, before World War I started and then it, that all got put on hold. And so this idea kind of came back in the 20s. Um, so these are a few more words from his, uh, his report. The Grand Mertz plan, I'm gonna introduce who Mertz is in a second. For the first systematic exploration of the Pacific Ocean, a great scientific feat that could have helped to reestablish the name of Germany throughout the world. Okay, again, not normally why we think of doing science. I mean, I have to admit, when I sit down at my computer and I'm really excited to look at data, I don't usually think, I'm doing this for God and country and it's all gonna, you know what I mean? It's just it's a very interesting sort of take on things. Um, and this was the one that really, really cracked us up, and you guys are already nodding at this, that he wrote in there, this is leading up to the expedition, besides the pioneering voyage and the Challenger and the Gazelle, there were the five above mentioned German expeditions, which we've never heard of, right? So that the Atlantic Ocean had rightly been called the Ocean of German Exploration. <laughs> I'm like, really? Are you crazy? The Atlantic Ocean was the Ocean of German Exploration. I mean, we thought the British thought they were the owners of the seas, but at least you can kind of see why, but you know, this is kind of weird. So, um, so here's a bit more about um, this guy Mertz, who he was referring to and, and um, his, his plan. So um, he was the expedition's creator and spiritual father. He was the director of the Berlin Institute of Oceanology and was closely associated with uh, the German Naval Observatory. So these are some of the quotes from uh, Fritz Spice's um, report regarding Dr. Mertz. He was a learned person aglow with scientific enthusiasm, endowed with profound analytical powers, a man of the most noble and genuine nature. He possessed an amiable temperament and the joie de vivre, typical of an Austrian, <laughs> yes. And one was conscious of the fire burning in this man, and in his last years, one could perceive that this sacred fire must consume him from inside in his capacity to work. And nowadays, we just call these people workaholics, but he was consumed <laughs> by a sacred fire. Um, there's a bunch of weird things going on in this report, and one of the things is that, I, and actually, as I went back looking for a direct quote, I couldn't find it, but we were pretty sure that what we were seeing <coughs> reading between the lines and some of the verbiage in this report was that the Germans were angling for a way to keep some of their Navy sea sailors trained out at sea on a ship, running a ship. They were not allowed to have guns on the ship, but they needed, they needed to keep those guys doing something. They wanted, and so keeping sailors out at sea getting trained by Navy personnel without breaking the treaties that were against holding a stand in Navy. So we're pretty sure that that was part of the subtext, but I couldn't find a direct quote saying that, but of course, he wouldn't say that directly. So what mostly the students and I were just intrigued and kind of blown away by the strangely nationalistic, patriotic, fawning language 
um, that he used throughout this thing. Um, sort of an adoration of father figure and fatherland. Um, so um, can, maybe you guys can help me because I was trying to think of an opposite word to patronizing. What's the opposite to patronize? Like looking up to your father so much that it's kind of out of control. There must be a word for that. I was bummed because I couldn't find it. But anyway, so this wor these words look so strange to our ears right now. But we should not forget this was Germany in the late 20s, right? This is the kind of language that kind of makes sense in a society like that, but it was just very interesting to see it written in a treatise that's about oceanography. It was a very, very um, interesting experience for us. So I'll quickly go through some of the uh, results from this project. I don't want to spend too much time on these. As I mentioned, they were doing a grid, a grid survey, and Sarah Jeffries is the one who put together all of these slides. Thank you, Sarah. I grabbed a bunch of yours from, your, from our class. These were the um, closely spaced stations at regular interval intervals that we were talking about before. <coughs> so the grid, the grid plan again. You notice, of course, they weren't allowed, they couldn't go into the Pacific. I kind of missed out on another part of that story that's kind of cool, which is that they wanted, they, they couldn't go to the Pacific because they just couldn't afford it. But they couldn't afford it not only because they didn't have money, but because they couldn't carry enough fuel, right? but they weren't allowed into enough ports around the world to be able to go somewhere and then refuel. So here, they set up a, a, a set of, you know, look where they're going. They didn't go straight across. They went down to Africa and then back and forth across the South Atlantic. Why did they do that? Oops, let's get the microphone here. So, well, they did it because um, there were, you know, some ports where the Germans were allowed. So Brazil and Argentina were two of the places where they could be. And it's interesting because Wirt, Wirt the, the leader of the expedition, the one who was the wonderful spiritual father of the expedition, he died actually during the expedition. Um, and he was, before he died, he was housed in the best German hospital in Buenos Aires. They, um, they lost another crewman, a signaler, uh, his name was Wunsch, which is interesting. He's not the famous oceanographer named Wunsch, but I thought that was kind of cool. But it, because this is not, I thought this was kind of interesting that it said at about one o'clock at night, our signal man Wunsch, while returning from shore in the darkness, fell from the bridge between docks three and four into the cold water and drowned at once. Okay, he drowned in port. That's yeah. Well, anyway, so you can you can surmise what was going on there. But so. The funeral at the German cemetery, they had to go to a German cemetery where they laid to rest our comrade in a foreign land in the presence of a large number of people from the German colony and the German ambassador, Dr. Neist. Apart from the German priest on behalf of the German colony, <laughs> Professor Wilfert spoke some heart-rendering words. Okay, they just couldn't lose any chance to say something wonderful about themselves. It kind of freaked me out. But now we'll come back to the science because these are really neat pictures. These are from the 20s from the expedition, a little hard to see, but a bunch of the sailors. Um, <clears throat> and now this picture I pulled out because it, um, it's got some nice, you know, they're taking some uh, navigation, they're doing some exercises, but what's the reason that I thought this was a good picture to show is that these guys are doing echo sounding. They've got their things on and they're listening, they're doing echo sounding. Okay, because this is kind of a big deal. Um, acoustics are part of the meteor story, and as we're soon going to see, they're an incredibly important part of the rest of the story of this Navy-ocean uh, oceanography um, interaction. So the First World War was the first one in which military submarines had a significant impact, but they didn't really have any ability to do detection at that time. They could use passive sonar. The British had some passive sonar to listen for other ships. But echo sounding was being developed in the late night in the late tens. Is that how you say that? And then into the twenties, it was getting better. There was a Canadian American named Fessenden who developed radio and developed an acoustic oscillator that could make a strong sound underwater. Um, and it was being used by the U.S. Coast Guard for iceberg detection. So by the twenties, I think it was patented finally at 1929. But the meteor had some version of that, and they were using it. And um, what they were using it for was to take an amazing amount of echo sounding data. So this is what I was saying about, not only was their hydrographic data just spectacular enough so that we oceanography students in the, you know, recently kind of learn about this, but they were taking amazing 
data about the depth of the seafloor. So the echo sound gives you time down and time back of a sound pulse. And, um, and so the, the top graph shows something that they managed to put together crossing the Atlantic. It's really detailed compared to the bottom graph, which was kind of what was known before, right? Um, so the um, Challenger expedition took soundings too, but they were much further space apart and they had no idea that the mid-Atlantic ridge was this sharp and this steep and that there were this many crazy seamounts and things going on out there. They just thought it was this big flat plain. So, you know, I, as I put this together, I was thinking, because I'm thinking more about the national strategy behind this stuff, and we, I usually think about just the science of these data sets and how cool it is, but you do have to stop and think about the consequences for that kind of data that the Germans were collecting. <laughs> um, Mapping might have been done with mining interests. That never really panned out. But if you think about it, there's a lot of economic and societal importance attached to this kind of data because of the transatlantic cables, right? They were mapping the seafloor to lay out the transatlantic cables. But the Germans, not, they weren't really allowed to communicate with other Europeans that much. They were now collecting the most detailed bathymetry maps of that part of the Atlantic that existed. And if you think about it, they were the ones who developed the submarine fleet in the next decade. You know, they might have been using this data for something other than science. <clears throat> they did some spectacular chemistry. They found the oxygen minimum. They found other things like the nutrient, the nutriclines and all the things that we take for granted now. They found that. I mean, I think the Challenger had figured out some of that, but they did a much, much better job. Um, they found out that gold wasn't on the seafloor and that wasn't going to really work out for them. So that's a good negative result. Worth it to invest something to find out that you don't want to go mining. Um, they collected a lot of biological data. Same thing, they're doing that grid sampling so that they started to understand things like the photic zone and the distribution and the, the latitudinal bands of the distribution of primary productivity. <coughs> And deep ocean circulation, this is the picture at the top is kind of what was, what they thought was going on beforehand. Deep ocean circulation means, you know, everything that's sinking, everything that's going on down below the top thousand meters. So if the ocean's about 4,000 meters deep, the whole rest of the ocean is doing a lot of transport too, but it's sluggish. So people didn't understand that at all. They made this map here on the bottom and it is remarkably close to what we understand now. They also figured out from some of the ridges and stuff that they were steering the deep ocean flows. They were mapping water masses. This is a huge leap forward in our understanding of the meteorology of the ocean. <coughs> and they collected some meteorological data. We've got some uh, balloons there going up and um, I don't think I know too much about that graph to be totally honest. I'm not even going to get myself in trouble by saying anything about it. <coughs> Okay, so a subcontext when you are an oceanographer and you know a lot about the Norwegians, a subcontext for me would be to ask, well, didn't, the, didn't uh, Professor Spice have anything to say about the Norwegians? And he didn't. I was interested in how adroitly he ignored the Norwegians. Um, he did say something about sampling bottles of the kind that Norwegians use, which we now know still as the Nansen bottle. But um, it's interesting because they really left them out, right? It's all about Germany. They left out the most, unarguably, the most advanced oceanographers and meteorologists of the earliest, early 20th century. So what I have here are um, three of them who were really big names. We have Friedhof Nansen, Wilhelm Birkness, am I saying that right, Suzanne? <laughs> and Harald Sverdrup. Um, and these guys, the way I think of them as the founders of <coughs> geophysical fluid dynamics, the dynamic meteorology and oceanography, it's physics, it's Newtonian physics applied to fluids. And they, um, Nansen is the one who figured out how water moves under the wind and figured out how pressure gradients are gonna cause currents. Bjorkness was the father of modern day meteorology. Um, he's, he figured out how to connect airflow to storms and pressure systems. I forgot to tell you that um, Nansen was also a very famous naturalist and Arctic explorer and that he received the Nobel Peace Prize for his international work with displaced victims of war. These are really remarkable people. But beyond that, he wrote this brilliant paper that we still read. Um, and Harald Sverdrup, oh my goodness, I lost my, I can't read my notes at the bottom because I lost my thing, that's not good. 
Um, I have it written down, I'm gonna have to wing it. Harald Sverdrup was the student of Bjerknes's and he, um, he's the one who figured out the basic physics of the gyre circulation in the oceans and um, he's very famous and you're gonna hear a lot more about him because he becomes a part of the really, really big part of the American story of oceanography. But the students here are probably familiar with the term Sverdrup, it's a unit that we use. It's a million cubic meters of mass flow per second, a million cubic meters per second. And think about what we do with river gauges, right? Cubic foot per second, a sphere drops a million cubic meters per second. <coughs> Big guy in the world of transport. Okay, so having given a glimpse of those Norwegians, I'm gonna move on now to World War II. And, um, you know, I think we've said enough about the Germans, you all know the story. And this is of course just one field. I think as I think about this, the World War II and the wars overall had such an impact on everything in society and all the other kinds of science going on. So I'm talking about just our own view of oceanography. <coughs> so Woods Hole had been a small biological station on the coast of Massachusetts, but it was transformed by a national push to get out into the ocean on ships and understand its workings well enough to go to war in this environment. Why did the military hand money over to oceanographers in 1940? Because the military was starting to do some serious work in submarine warfare, and the oceanographers were the ones who knew about acoustics and the ones who knew about water. So this really changed the scene. It, it, you know, you suddenly in the United States, you've got oceanographers being handed a significant amount of funding to do a lot of work and to do it really, really fast little different from the way we do science nowadays. When you're fighting a war, you're trying to get the interpretation of your data out as fast as possible. So this was a really, really big jump forward. So beyond submarine warfare, you need to know about how to forecast winds and waves. You think about all those beach landings, right, in World War II. You need to know about currents at depth for running submarines. You need to know about the chemical composition and the density of water to understand all of these things. <coughs> So this is kind of, this story sort of sets the seed for another background story that's gonna kind of keep popping up here, which is how physical oceanographers kind of took over the field from biologists for a while, um, starting out about this time. They were really getting most of the money. Um, and I, I view it as sort of, a, the biologists were sort of strongly rooted in the 19th century naturalist approach to ocean studies which is really cool stuff, but it doesn't help you win wars. And so the fast changes, the movements of these small laboratories to really big institutions with access to ships and expensive equipment was all expedited by this Navy connection. Is it enough? I think it's enough. Okay. So anyway, what I'm gonna do now is sort of talk about acoustics and it's gonna take us off into two different branches. First, I'm gonna talk about the strong Navy connection to submarine, using acoustics for submarine warfare and how that led to Navy funding of oceanography and meteorology, uh, water oceanography. And then I'm gonna come back to this other branch, which is seismics, including in the water, but also on land seismics and how they led to um, a branch that was really pivotal in seafloor mapping, seismic stratigraphy, and the things that led to our understanding of um, seafloor spreading. So, <laughs> my son Henry drew these uh, beautiful <laughs> submarines. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> so the basic idea is, you know, it's just about, I, I drew the little sound rays. His submarines are much better than my little sound rays. Cleaning out, reflecting back, you know, the idea is that if you can get that travel time through the water, then you've got a sense of where your enemy is, you can communicate with each other. So in addition to radio, using acoustic soundings to to uh, evade your enemy, find your enemy, lots of stuff. The German U-boats were attacking the Allied ships at night and um, figuring out how to hide from them and fig was a really, really, really big part of um, the defense of World War in World War II. So the picture on the right, water density, is just kind of showing that we need to be able to measure that in order to know how sound speed is changing um, and to map its, um, its rate 
And what the oceanographers developed during this time, this massive leap forward, was this thing called a, a bathy thermograph, and it could run continuously. Rather than dropping a bottle down and winching it back up and taking the temperature, this thing, as they were going around in their sub, could electronically record the temperature. And then the sailors on board could calculate the density of the water and calculate sound speed and calculate the ray paths and get to a sense of where the sounds that they were hearing were coming from. So this was a really big deal. <coughs> and one of the things that really got oceanographers going on this, so some of their big discoveries was that there was a shadow zone where there was a divergence of sound rays from a near surface source. They could be bent around and reflected by those changes in density near the surface. So these reflection and refraction from strong thermoclines. The existence of the deep so far channel, the sound fixing and ranging layer that's a waveguide where wave, where sound can travel for thousands and thousands of kilometers. You've probably heard about it because whales communicate via the so far channel, was figured out during this time. <coughs> Okay, so I'm now moving into a bunch of stuff that I found from this really interesting chapter. I think it was of a PhD thesis. I had a bit of a hard time to figuring out what the source was by this person named Ronald Ranger, which, and the, the title of this, this paper, it's a very long paper, I think it's a chapter of a book or a thesis, was Patronage in Science, Roger Revelle, the Navy, and Oceanography at the Scripps Institution. So all the next couple slides are stuff that I learned from reading that. Um, and Sverdrup, remember we mentioned Sverdrup, right, the famous Norwegian, he was um, recruited to come to the United States and be the director of Scripps Institute of Oceanography in 1947, I think. No, no, sorry, he came in 1935 to be the director of Scripps. Um, he brought status to the field of oceanography. It was a big deal to get this famous Norwegian and really brought up that the Americans at Scripps and Woods Hole. So in 1947, Roger Revelle was appointed to be the director of Scripps, and he had been, he had an oceanography PhD, but he had been with the Navy for quite a while. And so what was really interesting to read, I never had any idea about this in this, um, in this history, was that his appointment was kind of a battle. I mean, I would guess that. I mean, I'm a professor. I know that faculty meetings are always kind of battles, right? But this was really, I mean, these historians are laying it out. Like, these guys are like fighting. Well, he would be terrible because of blah, blah, blah. But really what they were fighting about was a power struggle between biologists and physicist types, physics and engineering types, right? So this quote came out of this. I chose to leave the rest of them out. But he's, um, Hubs, one of the biologic, biologists at Scripps, if Ravel were appointed director, Hubs and others feared his ties to the Navy, while important for providing financial and material resources, would privilege physical, chemical, and geological oceanography at the expense of biology. <clears throat> so, um, but, they, but they won. Ravel was appointed the director of Scripps. Um, and very successful time in the institution. They took it basically from being um, mostly privately funded, you know, funded by um, the Scripps family, I guess. I'm sure someone here knows this better than I do. From private funding to federal and state funding of this institution and really ramped up um, that kind of funding of oceanography. So, you know, the biologists were happy that Ravel did push for the very, very successful Cal Coffee Project, which I'm, I'm sure that you've all heard about. It was focused on understanding why the sardine fishery had crashed, and it made huge, huge progress in both the biological and physical oceanographic sciences. It was, okay, Cal Coffee stands for the California Cooperative Ocean Fisheries Investigations. How many of you in this audience have heard of Cal Coffee? I'm just curious. Okay, so maybe not everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was wildly successful and it was funded by the state. And so here we have an example of state nationalism. California, go California. Um, they really figured out a ton about how fish species vary with fluctuations in ocean um, water masses and currents and decadal sc scale sort of variability. <coughs> um, but the shift that the biologists fear did indeed happen in the 30s and 40s the majority of the Scripps PhDs were in biological science. 
But during the 1950s, Scripps produced 49 PhDs in oceanography, but only eight PhDs in zoology and microbiology. So the shift that the biologosphere did, did indeed occur. Um, Ravel was very, very successful at promoting science in the military and the money flowed. So the Navy established the Office of Naval Research and this set up this really powerful connection between the Navy and oceanographers. And it pushed the field toward these big institutions instead of spreading people around little, um, little various colleges, universities, and marine labs, they were in big institutions where they could work together on granted research. So, um, and of course, you know, this went on in other fields like, the, like space science and aerospace. And we think about all of the, the fields that defense was funding at the time. Um, so when I say granted research, I mean what we call now soft money. Um, in oceanography all over the country, you had a whole bunch of professors who could be professors, but they drew very little salary directly from their university and instead are drawing salary from granted research. And it was th those universities were thriving from this flow of federal money. So an interesting side note that I don't have much time to talk about, but um, a colleague of mine named Len Pietrofeza, who's at North Carolina State University, kind of did a, a historical survey of some of these things. And meteorologists and oceanographers were pretty much in the exact same field back in the 40s and 50s. They made some different decisions. Ravel was leading this charge. Meteorologists made a diff different set of decisions. And their effort for national interest in post-war time resulted in the National Weather Service and the infrastructure needed for the <coughs> National Weather Service. I mean, how would we fly planes around the country without knowing what is going on everywhere, right? So what this did for, um, what it did for meteorology was set up a national need for a, a workforce trained to be meteorological forecasters, right? That's great job security for academics because you can be a professor anywhere in the country. There's going to be a state university who needs to train forecasters and you could be a professor there. Um, oceanographers didn't do that and it's interesting um, because we really now uh, are in a situation that's kind of flip-flop. We don't have as many undergraduates in the country who need our training as the meteorologists do. So um, anyway, so Wendy, w to get back to this, the, the shift was to have uh, universities where you had a whole bunch of people who were doing science, doing real good peer science, but they were also kind of competing with defense contractors for money throughout the war. And I think it's just something we don't think about too often. So I'm going to shift gears now again and go back to that. That was the, the, the oceanography, physical oceanography side of what came out of the World War II work. I'm going to shift back to the other story, which is about seafloor spreading and the geophysics that got going, kind of launched by the war. <coughs> so this slide has a picture of some of the big players. And there are other big players that I didn't put on here. There isn't really space, but some, these are some of my favorites. Um, and where the story is all going is about how humans finally figured out plate tectonics in the mid-60s. So my pointer thing isn't working, but Maurice Ewing, the, the one in the bottom, is probably the most famous guy. His graduate student, uh, Heezen, is also very, very famous in this whole thing. But he was around earlier. He was around with all those other guys like Ravel. He was responsible for applying acoustics to solving this problem. He mapped all over the ocean. He was ridiculously good at getting ship time, and he even talked the president of Colombia into just buying a ship. It's a pretty <coughs> crazy story. Like, he made a phone call, and the, the president of Colombia was out with his friends or something, and he didn't want to answer the phone, and he came back the next morning to find that Ewing had bought the ship for the university. And I guess he got in trouble a little bit, but they, they had a beautiful ship, and they used it. He went all over the planet. This guy was insane. So I want, nobody said anything about consuming fires and stuff with him, but I mean, he was a super workaholic. Um, Marie Tharp, the one up on the top, there's a picture of her from 2001, and then the more famous picture of her is that one with her showing the map that she made. She's the one who made the spectacular map of the seafloor. So she was back in the lab while Heason and Hollister were out collecting all these soundings, and she was putting together the data. And it, given the talk we had this afternoon about data and how much effort it takes to um, look at stuff on computers, but she was doing drafting by hand, right? Resulted in the beautiful seafloor map that was one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle. You know, she's the one who looked at it and said, you know, the fact that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has this thing in the middle that goes like this looks like a rift valley. It looks like the rift valley in East Africa that we know is doing this, right? So she's the one who really kind of put that piece together. 
And you know, one of the few women geophysicists that gets mentioned, and probably one of the few that there really was at the time. Harry Hess was also a big figure. Um, he was a distinguished Navy officer, and he was also very successful at getting seismic data while he was out on operational Navy ships. He later became a professor at Princeton. Um, people didn't believe in plate tectonics while he was doing his work, but he's the one who came up with a mechanistic theory for why it, it worked. He's the one who suggested originally sort of the convective convection and crust riding around in the convection. So um, these three are sort of the big characters. And this is one of these stories that I could spend all night on, and I can't. I don't have time. But I think the seafloor spreading is just such a crazy and interesting and exciting story. And one of the things that's neat about it, it's like a 30-year revolution. It took that much time for people to figure it out. Um, there's a really wonderful book and essay by Naomi Oreskes, who's a history professor, describing this, that it was not the classic idea of a lonely genius, but sort of a collective push with a whole bunch of people coming at this with different kinds of data, and they were sometimes so different they weren't even in their fields, they weren't talking to each other. And sometimes accidental rediscoveries of something, a new way to interpret old data that had been around for a long time, a lot of people were involved in technology was really, really important. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, I suddenly understand this, like an Einstein type discovery, more of a, you just needed to really build up data that took technology that they didn't have. So um, the story kind of really revolves around Maurice Ewing. He was the son of very poor farmers in Texas. And it's, it's easy to find information about him because people love to write about him. He was really quite a character, kind of a cowboy, cowboy scientist. His family was poor, but they, they valued education and they made sure to send him to school. There's a really entertaining story about the first, when he left the Texas Panhandle to go to Rice University, that he had to ride the rails and he got robbed by hobos and he was slept out somewhere. You know, it was a great story. <coughs> um, he wanted to major in engineering, but he thought engineers were just, just so concerned with unnecessary precision that he just, he looked down on engineers. So he became a physicist because he preferred simple arguments, detailed and well understood and carefully explained theories. I love that, simple arguments. And frequently design instruments. So one of the stories that we loved, um, the students and I, was that when he was walking to his room, dorm room one night, he observed moonlight making circular bands of colors in the water, the dew that was on the grass. And so he went and got off a bunch of his friends and asked them to shuffle along in the pattern. And then he went and measured them. And then he wrote a paper that was called Dew Bows by Moonlight. And it was published in Science in 1926. <laughs> And, you know, every, the academics here know what a jackpot it is to get into science. But back then, a random, random college student could do it. That was pretty cool. <coughs> oh, but sorry, the main thing I forgot to mention, even though you probably read it already, but I didn't mention that. Come back. Come back. That um, he did, you know, that, that was a ray. That was something traveling. It's a wave. Physicists have waves that move. And he was, he was already there. You know, he worked in the summer times in oil explorations in Texas. So you see the, the cogs start turning right away. He's all about trajectories and rays moving around, whether it's a moon bow or whether it's acoustics looking for oil, explosives. So this is, you know, you always got to get something blowing up if you're going to give an entertaining talk. So we can even get some explosives into this. Um, this is another form of transfer of technology from the military to oceanography and ocean exploration. And so, um, you know, the military was doing this in a sort of probably kind of quick and dirty way. If you put a, a, a receiver on, your, on the ground and listen to the sound coming through, try to figure out where artillery is that might be hidden. If there's, you know, you know, better than just listening for it, trying to do, I guess. I don't know much about this. But um, the, that sort of general plan was taken to oil exploration, where you, you purposefully blow something up at the surface. And then the rays, of, the rays of sound go away, and then they get refracted and bent around salt domes, which have a different density, right? They're more porous, and they're lighter kind of, I guess I'm not allowed to say fluid, but that's how I think of it, a lighter substance that's down there in the earth. And then the sound returns. You can tell from that that they're being bent. It's how you look for salt domes. <coughs> and so Ewing had this knowledge that he took to mapping the seafloor 
And his mapping of the seafloor, what he also took from that was not just that you could map directly down and back and get the depth, but that you could map what was subsurface. So that was a big, big breakthrough to be able to come up with a way to use those oil exploration techniques to see what's going on down below the, the top of the seafloor and see the sediment layers and the rock basement below the sediment layers. So Ewing was very successful right off the bat. He was offered a job right away to go out to sea and use some of the explosive techniques he was working on when he was in graduate school. And he kind of just went rolling from there. He quickly became a professor at Columbia. He got Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory started pretty much single-handedly. And he was out on ships all the time. He got to go first on, the, on Huey's RV Atlantis. And I like this, that they went out eight miles in a whaler to drop blasting gelatin at even intervals back to the ship. But they figured out that there were basement rocks offshore down below layers and layers of sediment. They knew nothing about the, the geology and the geophysics of the seafloor before this. Um, they figured out after a while that you could lay, you could lay explosives on the seafloor, but after not too long, he developed a way to just trail the explosives behind you, right? You drag along with explosives, and that's pretty much still the general form with which um, geophysicists can do that kind of mapping. <coughs> so this may get a little, no, yeah, a little bit long, but there was this really, really um, great article written about Ewing from uh, the Columbia Alumni Magazine. I'm just going to put up some of the excerpts from this. This guy, Lawrence Lipset, I think is a very excellent science writer because he described it so well. By the end of World War II, physicists and chemists, including many at Columbia, had penetrated the molecular and subatomic worlds, revealing the fundamental structures and forces that compose matter and set it in motion. Similarly, biologists, of course, they're being a little Columbia nationalistic here, aren't they? Biologists spearheaded by Columbia, blah, blah, had launched sweeping breakthroughs in the study of heredity, evolution, the development of complex organisms, blah, blah. But of the larger world, our home planet, Earth, we knew relatively little. The Earth sciences languished in a state approaching astronomy before Copernicus and Galileo. And it is weird. I mean, this is the 50s and 60s. No one knew what had created the oceans, continents, mountains, islands, and volcanoes. The prevailing theory was about as off base as an Earth-centered solar system. And so um, this is a great quote here, that they were locked into the idea that Earth's surface was fixed and immobile. They weren't really doing process studies except on a Lilliputian scale. The caricatured academic geologist was an elderly professor mumbling of uh, the common fossils in the Carboniferous, occasionally stirring a cloud of dust as he produced a specimen. I love this. This is this guy's writing, and I love it so much. Um, OK. But that same year, a brilliant, entrepreneurial, relentlessly driven young professor named William Morris Ewing came to Columbia with little patience for traditional geologists, annoying fellows who spend their time poking around trying to explain this or that detail. <laughs> I kept wanting to say, why don't you want to see what's making it all happen? He thought geology was like trying to describe a football after being given a look at a piece of lacing. <clears throat> um, so for the first time, he, said, he forcibly applied the disciplines of physics and chemistry to the study of geology. I think that's a bit of a stretch. I'm sure there were others doing it. But this is, a, this is pretty much true. Such was his impact that in two decades, the methods he introduced, the instruments he built, the students he trained, the scientists and ships he marshaled, and the institution he created, now Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, essentially launched a whole new scientific fields and revolutionized our understanding of our planet almost as dramatically as Copernicus did centuries before. Anyone who knew him just called him Doc. <coughs> so remember also, though, that it was, uh, took a lot of work back home in the lab to put that stuff together. He was out tirelessly taking soundings, but other people had to put a lot of that together. So he was kind of pushing all of that data collection. OK, another really neat example of military technology transfer to science was the concept of towing a magnetometer. So if you want to see a ship that's subsurface, a submarine, one way you could do that, if it's got iron in it, is to fly around with a make something that's a magnet behind your airplane. So that was something that the military did, flying around with towed magnetometers. So 
this story is kind of interesting because I had read this part and then it turned out that Ewing's was already doing it. So Ewing's had some version of a toad magnetometer that he was using on the Atlantis and the Vima. But this is the story that I think is kind of cute because I think this is how science works a lot. That Ravel's hanging out drinking at a coffee break, drinking coffee at a break at AGU and he overheard someone say, gee, has anyone ever tried to tow around a magnetometer behind a ship? And Ravel immediately cited that Scripps should do that. But of course, he immediately found out that Ewing's was already, so they all just combined their tape. They, you know, nobody, there were some really good stories about data hoarding and hiding things from people during this time, but that group was sharing stuff. Ewing's was, was fairly um, generous, I believe, because he just had so much. He could, yeah. So the two groups started doing it, and they did it all over the world. And what they were able to do then was to start mapping out these anomalies in the magnetic reversal record that shows up on both sides of the spreading center. They didn't know really what they had on their hands. They got this data, but they were not the ones who figured it out. Um, but they were the ones responsible for collecting it. Uh, they, it took a lot of time to analyze this data. It wasn't something that you could see coming out of a ship because it's an anomaly. You have to take away the background field before you can see these anomalies. And they're not usually as nice looking as this because the rocks are always moving back. And no, it's not that a clean conveyor sort of thing. So um, Ewing's liked to do his, his data analysis out at sea or back in the mapping room. He didn't have much patience for the computing work it took to do this stuff, but some other people finally did. And Vine and Matthews in 1963 finally published a paper that put this all together. This was kind of the clincher for seafloor spreading. It finally, everybody accepted it. So this is 1963. So Greg, what was 1966 is when Moss Landing Marine Labs was launched. Three years before Moss Landing Marine Labs was launched, they finally agreed upon seafloor spreading. <coughs> so I hope I've convinced you that um, there was these themes that scientific progress required, well, in our particular field, that there was a lot of nationalism. Conquest and defense had a lot to do with the things that were chosen to study and the progress that we made. The transfer of ideas between the military and scientists and that certain key personalities did played a really big role. I mean, without Ewing's and Ravel, things could have been pretty different. I'm sure we would have figured all that same stuff out eventually, but they pushed the field in certain ways. <coughs> so I think naturally, before I end, um, I think it's worth asking a little bit about what, what about today? Are we still doing this? Uh, is that all in the past? Um, I don't think it is. I think this is not our history. I think it's who we are right now. I said when I sit down at my computer to do data analysis, I'm not usually thinking of the country's defense. But if you really think about it, we are. We scientists are trying to, um, to effect change that's going to help our country. I mean, we're also living in a world that was set up by their world. That funding model of, the, of federal research and the institutions and the people that do it and how we get funded through the National Science Foundation, the Office of Naval Research, et cetera, it's still our world that that world's changing a bit, quite a bit actually. So um, when I think about our own national security um, issues, we're not in a war, so this slows us down. If we were in a war, we'd be doing this stuff very, very fast. But you have to admit that um, climate change is a national defense issue. Um, and the military knows all about climate change. And my advisor, Arthur Knoll from the University of Washington had told me that once, he's like, well, even if politicians pretend that they don't believe in global warming, the Navy certainly does. Why do you think they're investing so much money in going to the Arctic? It used to be the Cold War and looking for submarines. It's not that anymore. They want to know when and how and where the Northwest Passage is going to open up. They're funding people to study. It's oil exploration, too. We should be honest about that. So the Arctic is a big push from the Navy right now. Um, yeah, melting ice. Everyone's pretty concerned about that. Storms, hurricanes, winds, and waves. This is a picture from Hurricane Sandy. You go on Google Images, and there's a thousand pictures. I kind of like this one. I don't know much about it. but um, So this is a big, big, big thing that oceanographers need to help out for national security because the increases in storms, hurricanes, winds, and waves. Longer time scale changes in deep circulation patterns, which have a ton to do with coastal issues of ocean oxygen, low oxygen, and, and ocean acidification, which is all about deeper waters making their way up to our coasts and fisheries. This is connected to all of these things, too. And um, I'll leave you with just uh, this is next week. 
uh, I'll be going to Washington, D.C. with a bunch of other scientists to actively lobby Congress, the congressional staff, about ocean observing systems. And here we are. What's the first picture that's put on this draft one pager? Hurricane Sandy demolishing houses, right? I mean, the argument is you have to fund this infrastructure. NOAA's doing a lot of it, but you think about those satellite pictures that you get on your cell phones, right? It's so easy, we take it for granted, but the, some of the satellites, there are no financial plans for refinancing them when they fall down. And they're about to go. There's, the, the federal government has no money to pay for that. So it'll be interesting to see how people respond when we no longer have those satellite images. Um, what you need to be able to do to predict storms is you have to know the heat content of the ocean. And so this is what we're arguing is that you need to have these buoys. You've got to have, beyond that satellite stuff, you've got to have buoys out there measuring waves to see the waves coming. You've got to have buoys out there measuring the heat content because the heat content that fuels the storms is what's necessary to forecast them per, uh, properly. And so this is actually kind of a big battle right now. I mean, if you think about it in a time of drastic federal cuts, we're, we're at the edge of potentially losing most of our infrastructure for keeping track of these things at the same time in a, in a period of time when the United States is starting to feel a real bite of uh, storm, um, ocean storm related massive economic uh, danger. So anyway, I guess I'll leave you with that thought that I think that we are indeed still involved in science for the sake of national defense and security. Thanks very much for coming tonight. I'd be happy to answer questions. Sorry, I went a little long. <clears throat>